Hey everyone, and welcome to our section on data visualization. So this is week five of our Analytics 500 course. And so now we're gonna get into a lot of code on how to make graphs. So first up, I wanna have a discussion that is a programming suggestion, right? And so we're gonna use ggplot2 to help create our data visualizations, which is one of the most popular plotting packages in R. However, the code can get really long, really fast because of the way ggplot works. So you should use what's called code stacking. Okay. Code stacking helps you troubleshoot. So you can see if you've missed a comma or a closed parentheses somewhere. And it also will just help you see what's happening easier. Okay. So here I've got an example of a graph that isn't running, but it employs code stacking. So after the plus sign here, which we'll discuss how all of this is built. I hit enter. It's neat. Notice here how it tabs over. Okay. That implies that it's expecting more code, much like when you're using the console and it gives you the little plus symbol, meaning there's more expected. Then while I'm writing this first piece, I hit enter after this comma, <clears throat> although it would fit easily on one line, just to show you kind of how code stacking works, it stacked these two together because they're part of the same argument for the same function. Okay. Similarly, these three are stacked together and these three are stacked together. Okay. When it came to a new stack to build, it moved them back over. So you can always kind of use code stacking as a way to tell if you've properly closed all of your parentheses or all of the arguments. And when it comes to ggplot, running it all in one line would be totally unreadable. So minimally, I'm gonna suggest you at least hit enter after every plus symbol. Okay. Now the plus symbol does need to be on the end of the previous line to let the program know that there's more code coming. It can't be on the start of the next line. Okay, so it should end the previous line. And the reason there's no plus symbol at the end of this line is because this is one piece of code. Okay. As you can tell, because it's stacked. So heavy suggestion for code stacking. It will just help you read your code a lot better. All right, so the outline for this section, which we're gonna break into three videos, I believe, uh, is to give you a quick reminder of how to import files. Two key issues when dealing with data formats for making plots, which is factoring, which we've covered, and um, melting, which we have not covered yet. Then we'll talk about a bunch of different types of graphs. For instance, a histogram, which we've already done in our data, sc um, data screening section. I've already forgotten if we've covered data screening, which we've already done in a maybe a previous section. Yes, in our, our section over functions and how to, how to kind of view data parts. Okay, data screening is next. I have been doing these slightly out of order. So we've covered histograms a little bit with the plot function, but and when we were talking about breaks and I was so like enamored with actual learning how breaks works, but now I'm gonna show you how to build one of those in a more complicated fashion to allow you to scaffold to learn how to build scatter plots, bar graphs and line graphs. So we're gonna cover like the basics of ggplot and then how to make each of these. So a reminder on how to import files. We're going to use the Rio library here because it's kind of the Swiss army knife of importing files. And it allows me to load SPSS files without having to remember that it's a special function. So in Rio, the functions always import. Now notice that I have this saved in a folder that's in the same folder as my markdown. So I have my markdown file in one folder and I have a folder inside of that called data. And inside my data folder is where this data set is. So let's quick pop over here and look at that. This is the sections on graphs. Like I said, data screening's next. Um, had a brain fart there. I have my section on graphs, my markdown file. And then I have a folder called data and that's where all of the data sets are. And that is why I have it as data slash chick flick. Okay. And that should work on anyone's computer, Mac, Linux, Windows, okay. as long as you have that same folder structure that I do. Okay. 
Now the real library can interpret these without a whole lot of work using that import function. And that's really great because then I don't have to remember the specific library to open a SPSS file, which many people use Haven and that's what it uses in the background. Now when you import um, SPSS files, they come in and they have these special marks. So it's traditionally a data frame. And what you see here is they'll have um, for some types of variables, it depends on how the data is in SPSS, but for a labeled variable in SPSS, meaning generally treated as categorical variable, it'll give you the label. So that label is gender of the participant. This is in the, if you are familiar with SPSS, this is in the like labels section, but then there's also a value labels section when you're labeling the numbers as, as names. Okay. This is equivalent to a factor in R where uh, male is represented by one and female is represented by two. However, when it imports them, it doesn't import them as a factor. Notice here that gender is a number, but it does show you all this stuff that is saved in the background. So by using the structure function, I can see what these numbers should amount to and I can use that information to then factor my variable. And there are ways to import this as like Haven labeled data, but I found it's just as easy to just import it, kind of look at the structure in the background and then apply that factoring on top. Because there are some variables that you don't wanna factor. So let's say you have your traditional Likert style scale of one to seven where it's strongly disagree to strongly agree on for our analysis, we want to leave that as one to seven, but it's really helpful to know which way is up and which way is down, so to speak. So we don't want that to be a factored variable in R because that would treat it as a factor or a character, which we not want. We want to treat it as numeric, but we still have those labels hidden in the background for future understanding of the data. So I'm going to just factor my two categorical variables here. And um, it's really important to notice that ggplot, along with many of the statistical functions we'll use throughout the semester, really require factored variables. They'll work on characters, but they like it a lot better if it's factored. So if your variable is categorical, go ahead and factor it. Okay. And, and this is just a, a reminder that this um, embedded data kind of thing does not necessarily translate to a factor variable. So they're currently listed as numbers. And so just kind of a reminder on our factor command here. Let me make the code a little bigger. We're gonna overwrite our original variable, which is okay, because we can reload the data set. So this doesn't change anything about the data that's being saved. This just changes the data we're currently working with in our environment. So we're gonna say, okay, this is the variable I wanna factor. The levels here, are um, necessary to, to be listed as the numbers that are in the data already. Okay. So when we're factoring um, variables, one thing that's really important to note is that the factor command takes the information that is already present in the data. Okay. So let me back up here. So the, we know that these are, my apologies. We know that these are numbers, one and two. Okay. And when I look at them in a table, they come up as one and two. Remember, this is the actual data in the, in the, in the data set. And this is the uh, frequencies of those. So I have 20 men and 20 women. Okay. And what the factor command does is it allows you to say, okay, take this variable, okay, which we did our data set dollar sign column name to grab just that vector. And here are the levels that you should expect in that um, variable. Okay. Now, if you had one, two, three, and he, right here on this code, you wrote one and two, it will drop three, okay. which you'll see in the next set of videos over data screening. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna buy the code a little backwards here, but um, you wanna make sure that this is what's in the data, because if you, um, put things in the levels command that's not in the data, it will just drop the things that are left over. Okay. And so if the data actually was one through 10, it would only retain the ones and twos. 
because that's all you've told it to look for. So this levels command should be every number or whatever it is you want to save. If the data is currently a character and you just wanted to rename it, you could say that the levels are, you know, A, B, C. And if there's a D, it's, it's gone, it's lost. You will make this mistake. It is not a big deal. Reload the data set, fix your code and run it again. And so this is one reason why I recommend as you're starting to learn this stuff, and I still do this and I'm, cause I can't spell to save my life sometimes, but as you're starting to, to learn this stuff, run the table command, see what's in the data, run your factor code, like what we've got here, and then run it again. You'll know right away if you've screwed it up because if the table has changed in a way you didn't expect, it's wrong. <laughs> So this, this is the key part here that people tend to mess up. So our levels are one and two, and we wanna convert those to male and female. Okay, and these labels can be anything you'd like, and they can have spaces, because okay, they're character variables. And that's useful when we're doing um, ggplot, because then these can be our nice pretty labels. And so uh, what we see here is when I rerun the table command, it went from being one and two with 20 and 20 to being male and female with 20 and 20. Cool. What if we wanted these in a different order? Well, I could say that the levels were two and then one and then flip these. But another thing that people sometimes do is they say, okay, the levels are one and two and here's the order I want them in. Okay, let's put females first. Be sure that the number, the first number here corresponds to the first label that actually matches the data. Okay, so don't reorder the levels to whatever, uh, the labels, excuse me, to whatever order you want them in <laughs> without also reordering the labels, um, the levels above. Gosh, I said that all wrong. Let me try again. Don't reorder either, make sure they match. Okay. So if I wanted to restructure this variable, I could flip these. Here's another warning to which I will just go and show you code-wise what, what can happen. Okay. Trying to think of all the things that I, I've done wrong. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna load up the data set. And as proof, let's see what happens if I leave off a level. Okay. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna save this as a separate variable just so we can look at it. Let's just say temp variable. Whoa, way too big again there we go our temp variable is a factor where we've ch using chick flick dollar sign i faces in the way there we go uh gender and then i want the levels to equal just one and my labels equals just male now that ran and now i've just have met so it has dropped all of the women in the data set. You'll see that they are all listed as NAs. So the labels, uh, the levels have to be in the data and that should include all of them unless you want to drop one on purpose. So let's try this again. And this time I accidentally did 10 and 11. Okay. Um, for reasons I don't know, I'm just... Okay. Now that temp variable has two levels, male and female but it made all of the data NA because 10 and 11 is not what's in the data set. What's in the data set is one and two. Okay. Now here's another thing that people will do wrong sometimes is they'll get really excited about what they're doing. Okay, and they'll run the whole thing twice. Okay. And so we've talked about the labels have, levels and the labels have to match. Be sure you put them in the right order. So one and two here correspond to male is one, female is two. If I want to reorder them, I should do it the other way. I should say the levels equals two comma one, and then the labels equals female comma male. So make sure they match. Um, but the last thing that you should not do is run it twice. Okay, why? Well, let's think about this. Okay, we'll run it once, and I can see that the data now contains labels. Okay. If I look at the structure of my chick flick variable uh, data frame now, it's a factor with two levels, but the levels, even though it shows me numbers here, it says female one, 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 right? The, the interpretation is male and female. 
told you guys I can't spell. Okay, so even though there's, it looks like there's numbers in the background, those just correspond to the factor level. <clears throat> so if I run it again, what happens? Well, I just said a second ago that the levels has to be what's in the data. The data is no longer one and two. The data is now male and female. So if I run it again, I'm going to wipe out my variable. Okay. So it is now gone. Oh, I can't type chick instead of check. Okay. So I've erased it because that data, again, was converted. So if you run the code twice, you'll also erase your variable. Now the solution to that is of course, just reload the data set and only run it once and we're fine. Okay. And that's the nice thing about Markdown is that I don't have to like re-import and click a bunch of buttons. I just, you know, hit this button to run everything above this and run this chunk one more time. All right, so back to over here. Now that's the first big thing is factoring. And this just gives us pretty labels. The other thing is the structure of the data. So I want to talk about data structure first. So why data is where each row is a participant or a, a I use participant because I'm a social scientist, but like a, like a one unit of data -ness. So if you're studying states, each row would be a state. You know, if you're studying customer, um, Customers, each row is a customer. Okay. If you're studying stocks, each row is a stock. Okay. And then each column is a variable. Okay. This is often called, um, there's two uh, tidy data. Okay. And there's two forms of tidy data, white data, where each row is a unique entity and each column is a variable. Okay. So every participant is their own unique thing and they get their own row and each variable, dependent, independent, repeated, um, sorry, repeated measures gets its own column. Okay. So you've a pretest and a post-test, they have separate columns because the pretest and post-test are assigned to that one participant. The opposite format is long form data. And that's where each row is some form of assessment and each column is a variable. So my example where I have pretest and post-test data, I have participant measure twice, once pretest, once post-test. And then because I've measured them twice, but that's that that variable there is the time of measurement, right? Is it pre or post? And the um, dependent variable, the measured data. What did you measure pre and post? Right. And so this long format data really applies to repeated measures data where we've measured the same participant on multiple variables. And you don't have to always reduce down to long format. It's just when you're wanting to work with data that you wanna plot uh, the long format piece, the like pre or post or you know measurement one, measurement two, measurement three, whatever it is uh, on like the X axis or within a legend variable, you have to uh, reduce that into long format. Okay. Long format's really nice because it treats the independent variable as one column and the dependent variable as another column. In wide format, pre and post are two separate columns um, because it's associated with each participant. But in long format, pre, pre and post the label is one column for the IV and the data itself is the second column as a DB. Okay. So each time point or repeated assessment gets its own separate row and each column still represents a variable. And often you add a participant ID so you know who's who. So to do this, we'll look at it in both directions to help you can conceptualize wide versus long format. And in this particular data set, these are from the book, is like, I want to test this Disney philosophy that wish, wishing upon a star makes all your dreams come true. And so we measured the success of 250 people looking at like their salary, their quality of life, and like some measurement of how much it, you know, their life matches what they wanted. 
and we've got a scale of complete failure to complete success. <laughs> okay, so we're a zero to four scale. And then we, that um, variable, this complete failure to complete success is our dependent variable. One of our independent variables is that we've told them, okay, to achieve this, wish upon a star, or work as hard as you can. That's one independent variable. Another independent variable is the time of measurement. Okay. So the wish upon a star, as hard as you can, is between subjects to pull us back together from things we've talked about. So it's between subjects because some people got one and some people got the other. The success variable is pre to post. Okay. So if time one to time two, five years later, um, that's repeated measures. Everybody gets scores on, for both time points. So we've got both types of variables in here, but anytime you have a repeated measures variable in wide format, it's gonna have one column for each measurement, but in long format, it's gonna have one column for the time of the measurement or the label of the measurement and one column for the actual dependent variable. Okay. All right, so we're gonna use the reshape function for this. Although there is a popular newer function in tidyverse called pivot longer. I've used the pivot functions. I personally find them confusing, <laughs> but if you like pivot longer, go nuts. If you've never done any coding, I think reshape is a, a little bit easier just because it doesn't have quite so many command options. Okay. So let's import this Jiminy Cricket data. Yeah, and let's look at it. So this is wide format. We've got their strategy. This is wish upon a star, work as hard as we can. So we need to fix that column for factoring. And then we've got pre and post. Each person gets their own row. And so that's why you have ID here. This is the row number, but the ID here is number one. And I have their pre and post score. This is wide format. Every person gets their own row. Each variable is its own column. But to make a graph of success pre and post, we need to combine that into one dependent variable column that has the actual score and one column that has the um, label of when that score was, was taken. So to do that, we're gonna use reshape. Okay. Now we're mostly gonna talk about how to go from wide to long. Long to wide is much harder in any library. <laughs> so if you ever have to go long to wide, I actually probably would recommend pivot wider um, because cast, which is the opposite of melt, and this is like the very like forging iron joke here, um, is also very difficult personally. <laughs> so I'm gonna recommend reshapes melt <laughs> and tidy versus pivot wider. But we're not even gonna touch that. We're gonna just focus on wide to long. And that's because most, most survey data comes in wide format. Like if you're ever using Qualtrics or SurveyMonkey or any of the survey software, almost all of them give you the option to get this in wide format. So generally when you're working with data like that, it becomes an issue of going from wide to long. So in the melt function, I'm gonna call this a new data name. I'm not gonna rewrite the data. I'm just gonna make a new one so I can compare. Melt is the first uh, is the argu um, function. Right. Cricket here is the name of our data set that we just opened. The ID variable here is any variable that's a constant variable that you don't really want to move. Like I don't want that column to go anywhere or get reduced or get moved. Just leave it there. Okay. And so here we want the ID variable and the strategy to stay okay. because those are basically between subjects variables. And so almost all of these are either between subjects like categorical variables or things like covariates, constant variables that are not m manipulated. Okay. Um, and by manipulated, I mean measured multiple times. They're not part of the thing that you want to um, go from wide to long. Now our measured variable here are all the column names that you want to um, squish down, melt down basically. So I wanna pick, if I think about this in Excel, I wanna pick up, back up here, sorry. In Excel, if I was to do this, right, well, hard way, 
I would pick up success post and I would just plop it down at the bottom under success pre. And so these are the ones that you want to combine into, I'm going to say one column here, but what I really mean is two columns, one column for the name of the column and one that's the IV, right? And one column for the name or for the number, for the variable itself. Now, as a warning, you can actually leave, if you have the ID variable in there and the rest of them are the, what you're interested in, you can actually leave measured blank because it will assume that you mean the rest of the columns. Now, what do you do if you have multiple measured variables? You actually have to do this process a couple of times and combine them. So let's say we had success pre and post, and then we had a separate variable that we were interested in. Um, let's see, uh, salary pre and post, for example. We do this once for success and once for salary, and then kind of merge those together. And that's really where a lot of uh, pivot longer gives you a little bit more options, but I just think melts a little bit easier to get started. So what happened? Well, now we can see that we have a new variable called variable. These labels are bad, but it calls it variable. And what that means is it's the column name, excuse me, it's like 20 degrees today. So my nose is running. Um, Variable here is the column name from the original variable. Okay. Um, so success pre or success post. The value here is the col the value from that column is where the names come from. Now, if I wanted to look at this, zoom out just a little bit here. Uh, da -da -da -da. Let's go through and run everything up to here and then rerun this melt thing. Now let's just look at long cricket here, where I can sort. If I sort by ID, you can now kind of see what's happening. The um, value went from being two columns to one. So this is pre to post for this person. And so what happens to our between subjects variables or our ID variables is they just get repeated because it's the same value for that person. They're still in strategy number one in this case. It's just that they have two scores um, for being in strategy number one. All right, and we'll do that, this melting thing a lot. Okay, so you get a lot more practice. Now, unfortunately, it always calls them variable and value. And those are not very mnemonic. So we want data sets that their column information means something. So that's why we spend time factoring our variables. And in the next uh, lecture series, we'll talk about data screening, which means making the making it clear what is what. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's rename these column names. Okay. We're going to use a little bit of subsetting and that um, indexing that we talked about in some of our very first videos. And so call names here will tell you what the column names are. Okay. And it prints out a single vector, a single vector, and it tells me it's ID, strategy, variable, and value. So one, two, three, four. And I wanna change those into something useful, but I don't need to change the first two. I just need to change the second two. Okay. So I'm gonna tell it to change number three and number four. And I just printed them out first, to show you that those are the two I was changing. And now I say, okay, those two things are equal to the time of the measurement and the score. That's much clearer. Now, now it's a little bit clearer what that column contains, the timing of the measurement and our score. So with that, let's start to make some graphs. Okay, whoop, bonk. Now with graphs, there's always a, a caveat. You can easily lie with graphs. It's super easy. I'll show you how, okay? And I'm gonna tell you not to. So graphs, according to Tufti, so Tufti is like one of the like most famous visualization people and um, has a kind of like set of rules that are very coherent for making graphs. You should show the data don't obfuscate the data, like hide the data. 
get the reader to think about the data being presented rather than some other aspect of the graph. So this is where you shouldn't use pink. <laughs> Although I, the R version of pink, like if you tell it to print something in pink is a kind of an amusing color or neon green, like you should present, like get the reader to think about what the data is saying and not um, the wild looking graph. Avoid distorting or lying with the data. And we'll talk about how so that you avoid doing the things and present many numbers with minimum ink. And I think this, that kind of goes back to when journals are printing articles, but the idea here is to um, basically, Tufty would argue against infographics, so like cute graphics. I don't know that I totally agree. I think there's some nice things that you can do to show the data that um, he might cringe at, but, you know, for example, we could use little emojis as our dots on a graph, but we probably shouldn't, right? Because that would also break rule number two, because <laughs> people would be like, are those smiley faces? Instead of, here's what the dots are telling me. Okay. And if we can, um, the purpose here is to make some large amount of data or even simple data coherent. So we're going to make kind of simple graphs, but as we go through the semester, we'll add more complexity to them because the data we'll be working with will grow more complex. And especially for bar graphs and line graphs, they encourage the reader to look at different pieces of data. When you make a scatter plot, really, you know, maybe low versus high or something, but if you have groups of people, so we have our success strategy here, for example, we're really wanting people to like make the visual comparison between the successes of each group. And so this one really um, allows us to think about where we place pieces. So in bar graphs, we have a choice of, of placement of certain types of, like if you have two variables, you'll see at the end of this lecture, um, the choice can be the X axis or the legend. And we can think about how we want, what comparison we want people to make and put those two bars next to each other, okay? Versus arguing that the, the comparison across the graph is more important. Okay. So put things next to each other that you want people to compare and reveal the data. <laughs> so we're trying to um, show the data, okay? Reveal what's happening in the data versus again, hiding the data. And so this example is from a publication and the question is, why is this so bad? And hopefully it's obvious that this is a terrible graph for many reasons, but some of the more important ones include that it has patterns. Patterns in violate are like minimum ink. Those patterns are not necessary for understanding. Okay. They look like pencils or like grain silos to me, which may show <laughs> that I grew up in the backwoods, right? Um, this is a 3D graph, which on general purposes you should avoid. And I can't even read <laughs> the, the labels on the edge of the graph. Okay. Never mind that the Z label over here just says number. What does that even mean? Okay. So mostly if you're going, the rules originally were no 3D charts. I disagree. I think there are some really amazing 3D charts that you can make. And if you want to do that, look at Plotly, which works on ggplot and allows you to make interactive 3D plots so that the user can like turn a 3D graph, which makes it more um, readable and understandable. And so for everybody, these notes said no 3D graphs, bad. <laughs> but now I, I will disagree and say that some 3D graphs are really great. Um, if they have three variables you're interested in, especially if you can use these newer code functions that allow you to interact with them. Okay. Uh, no patterns, depending. Sometimes patterns are necessary um, to distinguish between two different types of data. And uh, this one, I would say that it just depends on what you're doing. Okay, so if I'm making a line graph with a lot of data, I'd have to pattern those lines for it to be readable in a journal because most journals don't print in color. So color is better if you can, being aware that there are colorblind people in the world, um, but patterns will work if you can't use color. 
And the really nice thing is that ggplot has some cool built-in color libraries that are, are like red green friendly, for example. Uh, generally, cylindrical bars are just a waste of time. <laughs> Uh, no bad access labels. This is something we'll look at a lot and like don't like label your axes correctly. And um, in general, no overlays, okay. meaning you have much like my background here, right? This is most so you can't see that I'm sitting at my house, but um, the overlays can make it hard to to read. So this graph, same graph shows the data, reveals the data. I've got good X and Y axis labels, the number of obsessive thoughts. Who knew that's what number meant? Okay. We've got our color-coded thoughts versus actions, and now I can compare thoughts versus actions very clearly because they're next to each other. Okay. Uh, or I could compare by color, um, but now I can see the three different therapies and that there are a lot more thoughts than there are actions. So that graph is a lot better. And then this graph, which unfortunately from the book, the graphic is terrible, <laughs> which is sort of hilarious in the graph section, but it's two graphs about cheese and I love cheese. So, you know, but this is a thing that's very easy to do to lie with a graph is to distort the axis label. Okay. If a, a data, a scale of the data runs from one to seven, for example, like our teacher eval example we've been using in a couple of these, don't put the bottom of the graph as zero okay. because zero is not a point of data that you could literally have. And so that distorts the graph by making it taller than it should be. And in this example, what, what, we've, what they've done is they've actually made the data why like um, this is the good graph, this is the bad graph. Okay. Or we could go the other way, but essentially um, it says number of what does that say? Number of nightmares. Okay. Number of nightmares in a week. Right. And this shows about the range of the data. And this one here shows um, a much wider range of the data. So it's from zero to 50. If your data set doesn't have 50 in it, you've now made these two things look equal, even though they're more like this. I'll say in general, this happens the other way around is that people will, um, will stretch a data set. So I know there's this very famous um, uh, like political speech. Oh gosh, might be Sarah Palin <laughs> where they're talking about the debt and they had, they had, you know, two presidents compared to each other and they made the axis like 6.2 trillion to 6.4 trillion. So it looked like this huge difference if you couldn't read the axis very well. And in reality, if we kind of put the axis on a normal scale from zero to seven trillion or something, you would see that they're probably not really that different. Okay. And so thinking about the scale of the data is important as well. All right. So for this example, we're gonna do some histograms for this lecture and then we'll pause and then um, do some other ones in the second video. And the great thing about ggplot is that it is incredibly flexible. You can do almost anything. <laughs> it's very well documented as well. And there's an entire whole series of websites devoted to ggplot2. Okay. The bad thing about ggplot2 is you can do almost anything. And it really can be kind of overwhelming the first couple of times that you look at it. Um, this is the way I currently feel about matplotlib. It has the same problem. So the flexibility in, can create confusion, essentially. And there are so many days I have cursed at graphs. So, you know, if your first try doesn't work, Google it, look at Stack Overflow and try again. And another uh, library that you may need for your error bars is hmisc. So if you are making the graphs and your error bars aren't showing up, that's the first thing to, to see is that you have the hmisc library. You don't have to load it, you just have to have it because it'll load it in the background. But if you don't have it, it won't give you an error bar. Okay. All right, so let's load up a ggplot and talk about how, the, how this works. Okay. So the first thing that happens, now I'm getting old. 
So I don't know if you youngins have any, have had those like old transparency projectors in classrooms anymore. I hope not. (laughs) Because, you know, you'd lay a transparency down and then the instructor would write it on it, but stand in front of it and you couldn't see it. Right. And I'm left-handed. So those, those things are, you know, if I had to write something, nobody could ever see because I was too busy smearing it with my hand. But anyway, so the way ggplot works is a lot like one of those. You build layer by layer. So you're like adding transparency sheets one at a time. And that's the only real analogy I can come up with, unless you want to make like a multi-tiered sandwich. So you start with the bread and then you start adding the meats one layer at a time. Um, But that's essentially, we build this up by layers. Okay. So the first thing you do is define the structure of the plot that you want. And this is not valid code, it's not running, but it's the basic idea behind what you could do. So the first argument is the name of the data set or the data frame you're working with. Then AES stands for aesthetic. What, What pieces do you want? You put in whatever variable you want on X, whatever variable you want on Y from the data set. And if you want more, you can add color and fill or both. And we'll talk about what is the distinction between color and fill in a minute. You can have minimally, you have to have the data set and an X axis. Okay. Max, well, there's even more than this, but generally in the kind of max we'll get to is having X, Y, color and fill. Okay. So let's look at this in action. So once you, uh, save my graph here, for example, that is a blank plot. You can print it out. It just is a blank plot. Okay. It's a blank and ugly plot. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Now I can start to add layers to my plot. Okay. Many of the layers will start with the geom, okay, standing for like a geometric object. So a geom bar makes a bar, bars, geom dot, that's dots or geom points, sorry, geom dot, something else. I always want it to be, a geom dot might be the one that I have made up in my head. Let me see, that I always think it is. Let's see. Geom, okay, let's see, here are our options. A, B line, area, bar, bin, blank, box, plot, color, contour, there are so many, dot, density, dot, plot. There is a dot, plot, one, <laughs> error bar, jitter, labels, lines. So I hope hope you can see, like there are a lot of things you can do with ggplot. I don't even know what all of these are. Okay, a spoke, a step. Let's start with a simple one. (laughs) So we have bars and points. And then X lab is our X axis label. Y lab will be our Y axis label. And then we can add more. So we'll talk about how you can um, add confidence intervals to your graph. And so the simplest place to start is to start with something familiar. So we spent a lot of time talking about histograms and their shape, normal, leptokirtic, platykirtic, skewed, whatever. And so we've kind of seen how to build a histogram using the hist function. Um, Now let's see how we can make pretty histograms like the ones behind me um, using ggplot. So a histogram plot has, as its base, a continuous x-axis. Does not work well for for, um, categorical variables on x. You can make what's called a Pareto chart, but honestly tables are better for um, categorical only, or God help me, even pie charts (laughs) are better for that kind of single categorical variable. So some sort of continuous x-axis. The y-axis is frequency. So it's a count of how many times that has happened. And what a histogram really is useful for is the shape of the distribution, just like we've talked about. Skew, kurtosis, and how much spread there is in in the set of scores. The other nice thing a histogram will show you rather quickly as any outliers or unusual scores. So if everybody else is over here and you have one little dot way over here, 
Let me get my hand back here. You have an outlier. Okay. We'll talk a lot more about outliers in our data screening section. So let's start. We're going to use that cricket data. Okay. And I haven't, I'm using the wide data because I don't need the long data yet. Okay. I could use the long data, but in this case, I'm only going to use one of the variables so it can be in wide format. So here's what I'm going to do. The data set name is cricket. Okay. You don't have to do data equals, but I'm just trying to help by uh, adding this argument. I'm just reminding you that this is the data set. The aesthetics on a histogram only have the x-axis, so we're going to do success pre-scores. And I hit enter here just so that it, it was clear that it has to close the ggplot. So in my stacking of code here, notice how these two lined up, because that is the closing of those. Okay, so they, they, that is the end of that section. Okay. Now, uh, that's all. This is my blank plot. And so when you print out a blank plot, imagine that it's blank. So when I said that ggplots are, are by definition ugly, they always come up with this default <laughs> gray background and these white axis bar um, axis lines. This is awful, don't do this. But I wanted to prove to you that it's a blank plot. And I've got X down here, nothing labeled on Y because it doesn't know what to do with Y just yet. Let's add more to this. So with that blank plot, the simplest thing I could do is just say add plus geom histogram. And so that will make me this nice histogram. Okay. So this is an, a multimodal graph. Okay, or well, it's sort of normal-ish, okay. but it does have some dips in it. Okay, so it's not perfectly normal. I've got X down here. By adding geom histogram, it knows what to do now. Add the count as y. And if all you're doing is checking for, you know, skew and kurtosis, this is fine. If I try to send this to like a professional somewhere, they would laugh at me. Okay, so let's clean it up. I can change the bin width to make the bin sizes different. Okay. And so here, this is one bar for each point. So 40, 41, 42, 43, et cetera. Um, so it controls the width of the numerical scale here. And that's you know pretty much the same thing as, as um, breaks that we talked about with the histogram. So that has made the data a little bit more, a bit clearer that it's still the same shape that we see here, but less squished, right? So from going from 40 to 50, we've now stretched this out a little bit more. Still ugly. What else can I do? I can change the color. <laughs> this is really ugly, but <laughs> just to show you how this works. Um, color here is the outline of the geom. Okay. Fill is the fill of the interior. So fill is like that paint bucket icon in our old school and paint or kid picks. <laughs> and if you remember Max, really old, um, uh, like diagram software. <laughs> and so it's the fill option. And that's how I remember it, it's a little paint bucket. Um, but Color will always be the outside of the geom, fill is the inside of the geom. Now, why did I put that here on geom histogram instead of at the front in my ggplot code? Because if you notice, here I said we can do color and fill, and this is in the aesthetics of my ggplot. This is when you generally want to assign color and fill to a specific variable, so color by variable. Or you can separately color just this, just the geoms. So you can actually define color and fill in a bunch of different places. And I generally just play with it till it's the one I want. Now don't do this because it's really still very ugly, but I could make this black and white to make it a nice clear clean set of colors. Now, with my um, 
purple and magenta graph here, I can clean up the labels. So this is success pretest. Okay, that just clears up, the, makes the label look nicer. And this over here, instead of being count, is frequency. Okay, it's generally in a histogram, we label our y axis as frequency. Okay. So it's the x lab and y lab. There's also a title function, but we're going with APA style here and not using titles. But if you want a title at the top, you do plus title. Now, a second example where we're going to add some um, extra cleanup here is a data set that's repeated measures um, where each day of a music festival, when we get to do these again, they, uh, festival goers indicated their hygiene, where one was smells like toilet and four, um, four is, I'm sorry, zero is I don't smell like toilet, four is a do. Because if you've been to a music festival or any outdoor festival, it can get gross quick, right? So we have um, each person, this came through as a character vector. So we'd wanna convert that to a factor. And then they rated themselves on each day. Cool. So that's a repeated measures variable. If we want to plot every single day together, we'd have to reshape the data from wide to long. But at the moment, we just wanna do a histogram of day one. Okay. So now let's just run this whole thing at once. Okay, you don't have to run things one step at a time, like cut and paste the code. I was just showing you on different graphs, the different things, different slides, the different things I could do. Instead, we would just put this all as one big block of code and edit that until we were satisfied. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna do is create my plot object. Okay, so data is festival, aesthetics is day one. And then here, what I've done is say, okay, make the bin width one. So one point for each of the zero to four okay. and color those blue. Cool. I'm gonna give it a nice X axis label, day one, Y label, frequency. And then one of my favorites is this theme option. So theme underscore BW makes it a black and white graph like you see here, okay, minus the color I added. Okay, it gets rid of that ugly gray background. Uh, the one I use more often is probably Theme Classic. This looks more like what you see in a journal article. Okay, and we'll use Theme Classic in a little bit. So either one. There are other cool themes that you can use and you can kind of Google. And there are extra add-on packages to ggplot that add even more themes. So the theme option is just a quick way to like kind of wipe out a lot of those ugly defaults. Now, what can I learn from this graph? my face down a little bit here. We know that this data set is supposed to range from zero to four. And I made it, you know, one column for each number. And I can see it's a nice, pretty kind of normal graph from zero to four. And very quickly, I can tell I have an inaccurate data point because in the data set that ranges from zero to four, there's a 20. And so that histogram has made it real clear that something's wrong in the data. And that is the next week's lecture. So we'll save that um, for our data screening lecture. But this is one real nice thing about histograms, as you can tell right away, if there is an outlying point. So on that note, we'll pause to keep these from not being super long. And in the next video, we'll move on to bar graphs, line graphs, and scatter plots. So head on over to those when you're ready to learn some more plots.